sometimes important realizations can come unexpectedly. And uh, the moment that I realized that my brain is sort of programmed differently than others as a result of being the child of an alcoholic came while I discussed with coworkers a British romantic comedy. <laughs> so I was in my early 20s and uh, my coworkers and I, they were about my age, were discussing Love Actually, which was released in the early 2000s. And it basically uh, showcases these stories of love um, between these different uh, couples and how complicated it is, but it's very well written, I think, and uh, moving. And so we were discussing it and what we liked about it. And one of my friends brought up the fact that she thought there's a huge flaw in the plot, that one of the characters did something totally unrealistic and quite frustrating. And it happened to be Sarah, the character I enjoyed most in the story. And Sarah was a woman in her, in her 30s, very hardworking, uh, kind of shy woman who worked for a, an architecture firm, I think it was. And her life is complicated. Her parents are, de are uh, deceased, and she appears to be the primary family member uh, around to help her adult mentally ill brother who lives in a facility or a hospital. Um, and it seems he has like paranoid schizophrenia or something where he has these kind of constant um, meltdowns, and he frequently calls her on the phone, and she even takes the calls while she's at work when she's very busy. And it's very clear to the movie viewer um, how much responsibility she places on herself and uh, how much she feels that she must help her brother, even at the expense of her own well being. And so she has this massive crush on another coworker in the office, Carl, who's uh, a very hardworking and also shy um, architect. And he likes her, and but they are shy and awkward and they never act on anything until the company Christmas party when they dance and they finally get together and it's this awesome moment because you feel so happy for her that she's finally uh, doing something good for herself and maybe can have some joy in her life through her relationship with Carl. And as they're getting together, Sarah's phone rings and it's her brother and Carl, very familiar with her family situation, says, will answering the phone make him better? And Sarah replies, no, but she answers the phone anyway. And of course, it's this terrible situation and she needs to leave and go to the hospital. And you can see Carl is really baffled by this behavior and maybe hurt and angry that she again chooses her family situation, even though she can't cure her brother because she feels so responsible for him and knows that her presence or her involvement, she believes is helping him helping her brother. And so she puts her brother above her own well-being and this great thing that is now uh, happening with Carl. And so after that, it's awkward and strange between Carl and Sarah and the whole thing kind of falls apart. And this is so frustrating and mind-blowing for uh, my coworkers because they don't understand why she would do this and find it very frustrating. And they think that it was unrealistic that people wouldn't do this. But for me, I had the opposite reaction to it. It was very real that uh, it seemed definitely like something that I would do. I definitely identified with her behavior and her thinking, the sense of responsibility over her family members, the need to rush to the scene of everything that you know possibly happens, um, that sense of dependence that it's all she's ever known is taking care of her brother. And so it was very uh, realistic to me and very real. And uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about that, my reaction versus my coworkers. And I realized that it is entirely tied to the fact that I am an adult child of an alcoholic, that um, that's exactly how I thought and behaved as a child, as a teenager, and as a young adult. So in those years, ar around the time I was having that uh, movie conversation, uh, I was, you know, in the thick of dealing with my mother's alcoholism, where she was in a really, really bad uh, patch of her roller coaster ride that is alcoholism. And in the middle of the day at work, I would be gripped with fear. I would be sick to my stomach because I'd find out that my mom was wasted at home. So I would be worried that she would drink and drive and kill someone or herself, that the house would burn down, that she would do some other destructive thing as a result of being drunk. 
and um, I work in the creative field. So I think obviously this, you know, worry and anxiety that it constantly uh, blanketed me was affecting my work and certainly my well-being. I never had a real sense of serenity during that time. And I didn't talk about it much, but those who were very much in the loop ab about my uh, family situation, I know that it, my behavior seemed like crazy. Like, why would I get so worried that if my mother drove and killed someone, that that would be her fault, that it had no connection to me, yet it felt that I was responsible. It's my mother. Um, I should be able to fix her. I should be able to convince her to get help. Therefore, it's my fault that this terrible thing has happened. That's how my brain is programmed. And uh, in my 20s, I thought a lot about that. And I remember having a conversation with a friend. Um, and I told him how I felt really kind of messed up, like a screwed up person, because I think differently. I have these anxiety and this um, sense of responsibility beyond myself. And that other people don't have that who maybe didn't grow up with an alcoholic parent or in a dysfunctional environment. And I just feel messed up, you know, <laughs> and uh, still do, right? Still a battle, even though I'm a work in progress. And uh, he said something that has really stuck with me. And I try to remind myself of that. And that is, um, you know, you're trying to reprogram your brain from how you were trained as a child that you were always walking on eggshells, ready for the next terrible thing that would happen that you had to react to and try to solve. So it's only natural that that programming would then carry over into who you are as an adult. And then trying to train yourself to react differently, to think differently, to not have that anxiety and have what ifs and all these things that I battle um, uh, is going against the way that my brain is set to um, operate. And so that makes it a very monumental undertaking. And it takes a lot of courage because it's super hard. And I've heard from other ACOAs who say that when they talk with their significant others or friends, family, people who are close with them about uh, these feelings they have as adult children of alcoholics, they sometimes get this reaction like, don't dwell on the past or you need to just get over it. And the past is the past. Now look ahead to the future. And it's very, very much harder to do all of that than um, might seem from someone who didn't experience this, because again, it's this reprogramming. And I think that's an important thing that can be explained to non-ACOAs uh, to explain kind of this crazy behavior. And um, uh, the important thing is just to keep that courage going, because it is much harder to try to reprogram than it is to continue living um, the way that our brains were originally programmed as children of alcoholics. So um, I hope you're taking good care of yourself and that uh, you are a continued work in progress.